Okay. So um, today will be mostly review, hopefully. And I don't expect you to be able to remember all of these things cold, but hopefully everything I say today will will be like, oh yeah, you know, we we learned this in in physics 51 or whatever equivalent class you took. And I'm gonna start to use the notation of physics 51 and slowly introduce new notation that's a little bit more common in um, more advanced electromagnetism and more advanced optics treatments, especially when, when it has to do with materials. So you'll 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 get this in much more detail if you have or will take the the senior ENM class. But uh, this will be kind of a partial introduction to, to a bunch of terms. So, so the first little bit will be review. Second little bit will be a lot of introducing uh, what, what may seem kind of unnecessary, a whole slew of what, what, what might strike you as unnecessary definitions at first. All right, so let me just write down Maxwell's equations and, and remind you what, what, they, what they mean. And I'll write them down in both integral form, which we're not gonna use quite as much, and differential form, which, which we will use. So the first one is Gauss's law. So we'll just say Gauss, Gauss's law. And the integral form is that if you take the electric field and you dot it with some surface area and you integrate around a closed surface, it doesn't matter what that surface is, the integral of that dot product, so it's the amount of electric field that goes out of a surface perpendicular to that surface, that's what this is, integrated over that surface. This is the enclosed charge over this constant of nature, epsilon naught. And similarly, the no magnetic monopoles rule says if you do the same thing with the B field, B dot dA, and you integrate that around a closed surface, no matter what that surface is, there's no net flux that can leave that surface. Uh, magnets always come in pairs. There's always a north and a south pole. If you break a magnet, you get two magnets, each with a north and a south pole. And if you draw any surface around, around that magnet, even through the center of the magnet, even at some funny angle, even not symmetric, uh, you will find that there is no net magnetic charge, whatever that would be inside. Uh, and then there's Faraday's law. Faraday's law, which says that um, if you take the electric field and you integrate it not through a surface, but along a path, and uh, if you think of the electric field as proportional to the force, then integrating a force along a path gives you work or gives you energy or gives you potential energy. If I have a gravitational force pulling this pen down and I integrate that force up through, uh, through a path, uh, I get I get the potential that this pen has when I, when it's raised. So so by itself, this integral an integral of this would give me a an electric potential, but the closed integral of this along a closed path uh, would give me zero if there were no magnetic fields around. I the the potential is only really defined if there are no magnetic fields around. I go I start here, I go up, I raise the potential. In this case, gravitational analog of the potential lower it, I'm back to where I started, I would get no net gravitational potential. But um, when there are magnetic fields around, this isn't zero, it's proportional to the rate of change of the magnetic flux, B dot dA. So this integral and this integral are the same, except this is not a closed integral. The boundary of this surface is the loop that I've integrated around. So if I, I take my loop and I pinch it off, then, uh, then I will in fact always get zero on the side. Because if I pinch off the loop, then I have a closed surface and this surface integral is always zero. All right, so that's, that's Faraday's law. And then there's Ampere's law. Ampere's law with Maxwell's addition, let's say. So it's doing the same thing, but with the magnetic field. So I integrate the magnetic field around a closed loop. And very similar to Gauss's law, I get something proportional to the enclosed charge, I enclosed. But similar to Faraday's law, I get something uh, proportional to 
the time derivative of the electric flux. So the constant of proportionality is mu naught epsilon naught time derivative of electric flux that pierces the surface attached to whatever loop I've done this integral. And we argued in physics 51, if, if we make these loops um, little a little cubical volume and we shrink it down, or we make these loops a little tiny infinitesimal square and shrink it down, we can turn, we can use mathematical identities and turn these integral laws into differential forms, which apply at a particular point. So Gauss's law becomes that the divergence of the electric field at a particular point. So how much electric field is just being created and is spewing out of a particular point has, is, uh, is proportional to the charge density rho over epsilon naught. The divergence of the magnetic field, how much magnetic field is just spontaneously being created at a point spewing out. This is zero. Uh, these, uh, if, you, if you shrink this loop down to a little, uh, uh, a little infinitesimal rectangle and you, you do this in Cartesian coordinates, you ask what is the infinitesimal version of this, you'll see that this turns into the curl. So the curl of E is minus the partial derivative of B partial T. And don't, don't obsess about this partial derivative versus this total derivative. It's just that the B field depends on space and time. It depends on X, Y, and Z. Once you've picked a particular surface and you've picked a particular surface that you're integrating over, this integral no longer depends on space. And you just take the time derivative of what's left. You, you get a number that's not it's not a function of, of space and time anymore. You've picked a particular surface. So this is a this, this only depends on time. So it's a it's not a partial derivative. Here, the field itself depends on x, y, z, and t. And so uh, the partial derivative, just taking the derivative with respect to time is the right derivative to take. There's no, there's no path or something that that's relevant here. You're just asking at a particular point, how does that B field at that point change with respect to time? Only if I let time advance, not move around and ask, if I'm moving around, how does the B field change at, at this crazy point that's moving around? It's how does the B field change at a point that's still? That's what the partial derivative is for. And then similarly here, this turns into a curl. And here, instead of I enclosed, we have a current density, J plus, uh, and I might run out of board here. I'm gonna, let me just move this over a little bit. The edge of where the camera hits is not not always clear to me. Uh, okay, so curl of B is U naught current density plus U naught epsilon naught partial derivative of electric field. Yeah, I think that's still showing up on my camera. Partial T. Okay, so for basically this whole class, we will work in regions where there are no sources. So for this class, there's gonna be no charges, there's gonna be no currents in, in the regions that we care about solving these equations. There's gonna be no charge density, there's gonna be no current density. So, so this is true for, uh, for fields propagating through free space. Or, and we'll even see there's a version of this that's true for fields propagating through materials, as long as there are no sources giving off light in the materials or sources absorbing light, uh, like for detectors. So this isn't really true for sources of light and for uh, detectors, but we're not gonna analyze sources and detectors at this level of, of Maxwell's equations. Uh, to, to really dive into Maxwell's equations, what we care about are we care about the propagation of the light as, as waves through free space. And so that, that all just has to do with source free, um, source free stuff. All right. Um, okay, so let me, do, let me do 
one thing, which again is should be review from physics, uh, physics 51. I'm going to erase the, the integral form of these equations and just work with the differential forms from for today, probably for the next many days. So let me do that and I'll take any questions that you might have as I'm doing this. So the, let me just say the kinds of questions that we're answering are questions like, uh, if I launch one of these waves through, uh, through some slits or through uh, a tiny hole or through a tiny square hole, what, what is the shape of the wave? If I, if I have waves that go through an interferometer where I specifically have mirrors that split the light and then recombine it, what happens to those waves? And all those questions are, are questions where there are no, there are no sources. Okay, so, so let's, let's do that. Where, where do we get waves from? So to get waves, we're gonna start with, you can start with either of these, but I'll start with Faraday's law. So to get waves, start from Faraday's law. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the curl of both sides. So I'm gonna take the curl of this whole equation. Okay, so on, on this side here, we have the curl of the curl of a vector. And you could write out all these components in Cartesian coordinates. It's, it's a bit of a, a, a long equation, but then you can regroup that equation into the following. Uh, so the left side here becomes the gradient of the divergence of the vector in question. And this is true not just for the electric field, but this is for any, uh, this is just a vector identity, true for anything in general, minus the Laplacian. So partial two, two derivatives with respect to X plus two derivatives with respect to Y plus two derivatives with respect to Z of E. So this is just a vector identity here, nothing having to do with E and M, equals minus partial partial T. Since partial derivatives commute, this is a spatial partial derivative instead of time partial derivative of the curl of V. Okay, now what can we say here? Um, the divergence of E has to do with the charge density, but if we're, if we're working in empty space, this is zero in free space. And on this side of the equation, let me just plug in this. So this is minus um, time derivative of u naught j, which again is gonna be zero for our region of interest, plus u naught epsilon naught, another time derivative, this time of e again. Okay, this marker is getting a little bit low. So this one's zero and free space. And let me just regroup all these terms and write, um, write what we have here. So there's, there's two negatives that are left. There's this negative and there's this negative here. So let me, on this side, uh, let, me, let me get rid of the negatives. So this, this negative and this negative are gonna go away. And let me move this time derivative over to the other side. So I get two, two derivatives with respect to time of E equals what? Well, on this side, I have uh, one over u naught epsilon naught. I'll show you why I did that in a second. Laplacian squared of E. Okay. So as a vector equation, this, this is true for the X component of E, it's true for the Y component of E, and it's true for the Z component of E. So there are just three completely separate, completely independent equations here. And let's look at the units for a second. So the, there's E on both sides, so I can ignore the units of E. 
that this has units of one over time squared. And this has units of one over space squared. And so in order to, to match the units, this has to have units of something like meters squared per second squared. And in fact, if you calculate what this is and you work it out, this is actually equal to C squared. So, so let me write that. I think I have some room here. Let me rewrite this as meter squared per second squared. So here I have two derivatives with respect to time equals C squared, two derivatives with respect to space. All right. And I could have, instead of starting with Faraday's law here and taking the curl, I could have started with Ampere's law here and taken the curl, gone through all of this stuff too, and I would have gotten the same equation for B. So, and two derivatives with respect to B, uh, two derivatives of B with respect to time equals C squared times the Laplacian of B. All right, and this, this is the equation for a wave. So if you look at just EX, for example, um, there are many different solutions to this, but if you, whenever you have two spatial derivatives uh, equaling two time derivatives with some factor here, the solutions of these equations are waves that are propagating with, uh, with some speed. All right, and we'll, we'll go over that in excruciating detail in a little bit. But let me just, this is just sort of the, the motivation for, for how Maxwell's equations give you, give you waves that turn out to be waves of light. All right, so let me write down some properties of these waves for, for future reference. Uh, where should I put that? Um, and these, I'm not gonna derive each of these, but they come simply from just examining, uh, examining each of these, um, examining waves as applied to each of these equations. But one of the properties is that E, e is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And B is also perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And E, e is perpendicular to B. So that comes from the fact that you know, if you take the curl of something, the right-hand rule will give you some perpendicular component. So B, B and the way B is changing is gonna be perpendicular to E. Um, that, so, uh, so these are each perpendicular to each other. And this cross product gives, gives the direction of propagation. In fact, it gives you a little bit more if you, if you calculate this thing called the pointing vector, which is just proportional to E cross B, one of them you not E cross B. It's the pointing vector. It gives, it gives power, power per area of a traveling wave. So, so you can calculate for, for a laser beam, if you take the E field and you cross it with the B field, every point there, there's some amount of power in watts per area, per meter squared, uh, in, in a particular, going in a particular direction. And that's what this pointing vector gives you. Um, and yeah, let me, let me pause there. All right, so, so that's kind of the review of basic Maxwell's equations in vacuum and, uh, and things that should be at least familiar from, uh, from physics 51 or equivalent. Now let me talk about what happens in media because a lot of the extra notation that we're gonna have to introduce that you may not have seen in, in, uh, in physics 51 has to do with the fact that we often care about uh, electromagnetic waves going through things like glass or water or plastic, you know, clear, clear media with some index of refraction. And I'm going to talk about what, what clear media does and talk about what, what the index of refraction is at the sort of microscopic level of the, of Maxwell's equations. 
after I introduce some uh, some notation that's appropriate here. All right, so let me, before we talk about waves going through a media, let me just remind you of something that may also be a review, which is, uh, well, I, if, if you had a capacitor with a bunch of plus charges here, plus, 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 and a plate of a capacitor with a bunch of minus charges here, minus, 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 um, the electric field would be pointing from positive to negative, and it would exist everywhere in between these plates. And there's some electric field that goes outside of the plates, but that's uh, very weak compared to the electric field in between the plates. Now let's imagine it's sticking a slab of glass or water or plastic or some sort of material uh, inside of here. What happens to uh, what happens to that that material? Well, if there's let me let me focus on one of the atoms that's going to be in here. So if you imagine some electric field that's pointing down, each of the atoms of that material is is not a metal. They, the electrons can't move around. The electrons are all bound to the atoms of that material. And so there's some proton here with a positive charge and some electron with a negative charge. And that electron is going to be pushed away a little bit. So if you sort of think about it in the classical picture of an atom, the orbit is going to be a little bit asymmetric for this electron. It'll separate the average positive charge inside of the atom from the average negative charge inside of that atom. And this is drawn extremely exaggerated. The actual separation is incredibly tiny compared to the, the scale of the, of the atom. But it's still, this electric field will pull, pull away the positive from the negative charges. And if we have a whole slab of this stuff, then you can think about it as pulling, again, a quite exaggerated picture here, pulling all the negative charges of, in that slab a little bit up. And let me, let me draw. So here's the kind of a slab of all the, the electrons and pulling the slab of positive charges a little bit down. Sorry. That. So the bulk of the slab is still net neutral because the, the positive charges have moved down and the negative charges have moved up. So there's a little bit of excess bound charge at the top and a little bit of excess bound charge at the bottom. All right, now, now we're going to start to get to some, some definitions here that, that will connect to uh, the, the notation that we're going to use from the book. So let's define this charge here on top as plus Q free. And this is minus Q free. So these are the free charges. And they're free in the sense that they're in metal and they can move around and they're free in the sense that we we can put them on or take them off by ap applying voltages and currents and stuff um, as opposed to bound charges which are bound to this sort of think about it as a piece of glass uh, those those charges inside of the glass aren't aren't going to jump onto the metal because they're bound to the atoms of the glass now let's define define e free as as the um, as a field that would have been there if you didn't have the material as the e field would have been there without the material So, so first of all is, and I'll ask this to everyone, is E free bigger or smaller than the actual electric field that is that is in here? So let me draw, 
an actual electric field, E. If I keep the same Q and I put this slab in and a few, I may have drawn this a little bit exaggerated, but you know, a few of the negative charges get pulled this way and a few of the positive charges get pulled that way. Does the slab increase the electric field inside or does it decrease the electric field inside? And I can't see if anybody's raising their hand, so you just have to shout it out. I feel like it decreases it, but I was also awful at E and M, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so so why why do you feel that it decreases it? Um, I guess it's like almost like the. Um, like the net charge. Like the difference between the two um, parallel plates has decreased in their like negative relative negativeness and positiveness. Yes, that that is that is a good way of saying it. So, <laughs> so um, you're, you're right. If you keep the same Q free, if you if you charge this capacitor up and you just let go of the thing you've charged it up with, and then you insert um, and you insert a slab. Um, because the negative charges in the slab have moved up, they, they kind of cancel out some fraction of the positive charges here in terms of what the actual electric field inside is. And same thing here, the, the positive charges in the slab will kind of cancel out some of these negative charges. And so from the perspective of something in the center, when it's, when it's looking at you know, effectively how much charges above me and how much charges below me, it's, effectively less when there's when there's a, a slab here. So the, the free field, the field that would have been there um, is is bigger. And, and so we'll define E free as some constant of proportionality kappa kappa sub E of E, the actual field that's actually there. And this constant of proportionality is bigger than or equal to one. And this is something that's uh, that can be determined experimentally by sticking various slabs of various things. And so for, for glass, kappa E is 2.3. And for water, kappa E is 1.7. So, so we're going to define this free field as a field that would have been there if we had no slab, but the field that's actually there is going to be a little bit smaller. Um, similarly, and this is not going to be super relevant for optics, but similarly, we can define uh, define a, another uh, another constant of proportionality for the magnetic field. So I'm not even going to draw the picture, but I'll, I'll just write how it's typically defined. So because of the way magnetic fields work a little bit differently instead of uh, instead of kind of compensating like this with the material if you have a if you have a bunch of magnets they tend to align with the magnetic field the constant of proportionality has to be on the other side kappa b uh, or i guess it's called kappa m and so these are uh, for materials that uh, are not like uh, not like iron, where where you can make permanent magnets out of them, but these are so-called uh, paramagnetic materials that whose atomic spins align a little bit with the with the free magnetic field to enhance the the magnetic field. And there are there are many examples of this in in everyday life. Something like liquid oxygen is is kind of a is an example of this. And it's, it's kappa M is something like 1.0000001. So it's a very small effect. Uh, there, the iron-like materials that can form permanent magnets, they, 
this isn't really a great way of describing them uh, because after you take away the free field, they still have some magnetic field. But also light does not go through iron permanent magnets. So, so we're not really interested in that. But because of this, because you need kind of obscure materials like liquid oxygen to, to even see this kind of effect uh, for, for clear materials, uh, we, we will almost always ignore the fact that uh, the free magnetic field is going to be different from the actual magnetic field. Whereas for the electric field, you can see even for normal materials like glass and water, this effect is, is pretty big. All right. So now in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to define some, uh, I'm going to define some, uh, some other, some other quantities that are going to be used in, in the way that we will write and use Maxwell's equations in materials. So let me, let me see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this. And this. Oh, uh, much as I, I love this picture with the colors, I'm gonna erase the picture with the colors right here. All right. Okay, so here there's gonna be a whole slew of definitions. All right, so if this is the case here, if, if E free equals kappa E, let me take this equation and multiply both sides by epsilon naught. So epsilon naught E free, the electric field that would have been there without the material equals epsilon naught this sort of dimensionless constant of proportionality E that is in fact there. Let me define this side as this new field called D. Um, this is sometimes called the displacement field, which is why it's given the name D. It's just epsilon naught times a field that would have been there. If we don't worry about the fact that the slab is there, if we just calculate it using just the, the free charges that we can control. And let me define this combination of epsilon naught and kappa E as just epsilon with no subscript. So epsilon naught for glass, sorry, epsilon for glass is 2.3 times epsilon naught. And this, this becomes the, the, uh, uh, the constant that goes into calculating the capacitance, say, uh, if you're if you're calculating the capacitance of a capacitor, you use this epsilon. All right, and then similarly for B, and because it's kind of opposite, we're going to define B as mu times H. And for us, mu is really really close to mu naught. And this defines this H field, which is. Um, sometimes called the magnetizing field. So this is the magnetic field, and this is the magnetizing field. It's the, the field that, uh, that's surrounding the liquid oxygen, that's magnetizing it a little bit, so that inside of the liquid oxygen, the actual magnetic field is ever so slightly bigger than it would have been if you didn't have the, the, uh, the H there. Uh, okay. And let me rewrite Maxwell's equations here in terms of these new fields. And that will become our, uh, our Maxwell's equations in, in media. And this is actually how Maxwell originally wrote them. So there's some historical inertia here, but it's also useful for working with, with uh, electromagnetic fields in media. All right, so, so Gauss's law Instead of, so, so all these equations still hold, but the problem with equations like this is that the divergence of E equals rho, this rho refers to the total charge, the total charge density, both the charge density of the, the stuff on the metal that you can control and also the charge density of the, uh, of those, uh, bound charges in the glass. 
And so this is, the equation is still true, but it's not as useful because it's not in terms of the things that we can freely control. So when we, when we write this in terms of the things we can control, we get a pretty simple equation that the divergence of D equals rho free over, uh, actually, actually that's it, just rho free because the epsilon is already kind of included in the definition of, of D. Okay, so rho free. All right, and this makes sense because you know, we defined our D to be epsilon naught times the, the uh, electric field that would have been there if all we had were free charges. Um, this equation doesn't change, so that, that one stays. I'm not gonna rewrite that in terms of H, so only, only some of them get rewritten. So this one also doesn't change. So Faraday's law stays Faraday's law. Um, but this last one changes uh, uh, both the B and the E turn into H and D. And the, the mu's all sort of get absorbed appropriately. So here, the curl of H, which again is basically B. So for all, all the materials we care about, you could just sub, substitute in B here, equals instead of mu naught J, it's gonna be just J free because imagine dividing this whole equation by mu naught and divide this whole equation by mu naught and B over mu naught just became H here. Um, plus uh, I'm gonna absorb this epsilon naught into E, but uh, because I'm only, because this equation is only an equation involving free things, it, it's not just epsilon naught E, it's epsilon naught E free. And that, that is D. So plus time derivative of D. All right, so like I said, this is um, a bunch of new notation here with Ds and Hs. And instead of epsilon naught, it's epsilons and mu's. But this will give us a set of equations that apply uh, to, to waves inside of materials where we don't have to worry about the, the fact that there, we have to worry about uh, charges uh, on the metal that we can control and also these bound charges that can move around and, and, uh, and compensate for the charges that we can control. This is a set of equations just in terms of the things we can control. And uh, the, the bound charges kind of come along for the ride and just adjust the constants a little bit if we want to translate them back into real E fields and real B fields. Uh, so this is, this is a set of Maxwell's equations in, in media. And let me, let me do, well, let, let, me, let me just pause there. Next time we will start by taking this set of Maxwell's equations in media and doing the same thing I did before, which is to ask, uh, what if I take the curl of this equation and do all the, the right substitutions? Um, I will get a wave, but that wave will propagate at a slightly different speed. And that speed will have to do with kappa E and to some extent kappa M, but we're, we're not really so worried about that. Um, the new speed will have to do with this kappa E. And that will relate things like the dielectric constant of materials that we can measure by putting them inside of a capacitor to the index of refraction, the new speed of waves that go through those clear dielectric materials. And, and that's where we'll start next time. All right, hopefully this was a bunch of review combined with a bunch of motivated, but still kind of, uh, uh, maybe at this point, needlessly complicated seeming definitions, but uh, it's useful for for waves inside of a material. All right, any any questions before I have to get going? All right, I will see you on Wednesday oh, for. I want to just oh. ask you one quick question about the homework, Prof. Kalikia. Uh, homework two. Yeah. Yeah. So just for the last one, where we are. Um, 